Hello, everyone. Today, we will dive into an important topic in strength of materials, the concept of stress. We will cover its definition, components, the idea of normal and shear stresses, stress tensor, complementary shear, and principal stresses and planes. Concept of stress, definition and components of stress. We have seen that tractions exist across every internal surface element of a body subjected to external forces. The concept of stress helps us to investigate the nature of the distribution of the internal forces over any internal surface. Figure 1.8a shows such an arbitrary internal surface, which has been exposed by removing a part of the body. Internal forces are assumed to be continuously distributed over this cut face A, and we wish to know the intensity of these forces at any point P on the face. For this, we consider an elemental area delta A surrounding the point P, where delta A is very small compared to the area of the section A, but it is large enough with respect to the intermolecular spacing. The internal forces over the elemental area delta A may be reduced to a resultant elemental force delta F and an element couple delta M, as we did for the entire section and acting at the point P. In general, delta F and delta M would be inclined to the normal N to the surface. We now define the stress vector SN at point P on the section A, represented by the outer normal N, as the intensity of internal forces per unit area. The stress vector with respect to the normal vector N is defined as the limit as the area tends to zero of the ratio of the change in force to the change in area. This is equivalent to the derivative of the force with respect to the area. Or, uh, the stress vector with respect to the normal vector N is equal to the ratio of the change in force to the change in area, see figure 1.8. However, this definition of stress is inadequate as it gives only an average value of the stress at the given point. The continuum hypothesis enables us to define the stress more precisely as the stress vector with respect to the normal vector n is equal to the limit as the area tends to zero of the ratio of the change in force to the change in area. This is equivalent to the derivative of the force with respect to the area or S of N is equal to the limit as delta A tends to zero of delta F over delta A, which is equal to DF over DA. We assume here that the value of this limit exists and is unique and that it is independent of the shape of delta A and the manner in which delta A tends to zero. It is customary to express the stress vector SN in terms of its normal and tangential components. Figure 1.8b, shows the components delta Fn and delta Ft of the force delta F in the normal N and tangential T directions, respectively. We now define normal and tangential shear stress as follows. For normal stress, sigma N is equal to the limit as the area tends to zero of the change in the normal force divided by the change in the area. This is equivalent to the derivative of the normal force with respect to the area. For shear stress, tau n is equal to the limit as the area tends to zero of the change in the tangential force divided by the change in the area. This is equivalent to the derivative of the tangential force with respect to the area. Or for normal stress, sigma n is equal to the limit as delta a tends to zero of delta fn over delta a, which is equal to dfn over dA. For shear stress, Tau n is equal to the limit as delta A tends to zero of delta Ft over delta A, which is equal to dFt over dA. We can have components of Ft in any two orthogonal directions in the plane, such as T1 and T2, see figure 1.8b, and there would then be two components of shear stress on the plane, namely tau n1 and tau n t2. The coordinate axes may be selected suitably with respect to the elemental surface to indicate the stress components conveniently. For a given orientation of the elemental surface, there are, in general, three components of stress. One normal stress, sigma nn, and two shear components, tau nt1 and tau nt2. These components will be different for different surface elements passing through the same point. 
Figure 1.9 shows three orientations of the surface elements passing through point P of the body shown in figure 1.8. In figure 1.9a, the element has its outer normal in the positive x direction and hence is called the positive x face with the components of stress on this face being sigma xx, tau xy, and tau xz. These components are pointing toward the positive directions of the axes and hence they are positive as per our sign convention laid down in Similarly, figure 1.9b shows the components sigma yy, tau yx, and tau yz on the positive y face, and figure 1.9c shows the components sigma zz, tau zx, and tau zy on the positive z face. At this stage, we may realize that innumerable orientations of surface elements are possible through a given point of a stressed body, and so there are countless possible stress components associated with that point. However, only the aforesaid nine components of stress with respect to a given set of axes are actually needed to completely specify the state of stress at that point. We now recall that there also exists an elemental couple delta M in addition to the elemental force delta F on the elemental surface delta A. We consider the ith particle on the surface element given by its position vector Ri with respect to point P as shown in figure 1.10. If the infinitesimal force on this particle is d phi and the concentrated body couple is dmi, then delta m can be written as. For the first equation, delta m is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of r sub i crossed with dfi plus the sum from i equals 1 to n of dmi. For the second equation, we define the couple stress vector m of n as the limit as delta a tends to 0 of delta m over delta a. For the third equation, in the absence of body couples, the couple stress vector vanishes as the limit as delta A tends to zero of delta M over delta A is equal to the limit as delta A tends to zero of R sub I crossed with D phi. For the final part, and the limit on the right-hand side vanishes in view of the fact that R sub I tends to zero when delta A tends to zero. In this elementary text, we would not encounter situations where body couples and couple stresses exist. As such, these will not come under our consideration. Stress tensor. We have seen that the state of stress at any point in a stressed continuum is understood to mean the set of stress components on all positions of an elemental surface passing through that point. In figure 1.9, we had shown three different positions of the surface element parallel to a reference plane in each case, and the respective stress components were also shown. The nine stress components so obtained are conventionally represented in a different manner as shown in figure 1.11. An elemental volume, delta x times delta y times delta z, in the form of a rectangular parallelepiped around the point P, X, Y, Z in question has been isolated. The positive X face, A, B, C, D, does not pass through the point P, and the components of stress are actually acting at the point P prime, X plus delta X over two Y, Z. However, in the limit as delta X tends to zero, P prime and P coincide. Hence, for an infinitesimal volume element, the face ABCD may be assumed to be passing through the point P, as shown in figure 1.9a. Similarly, the positive Y face ABGF and the positive Z face ADEF may also be taken to pass through P. Although we have not shown the components of stress on the remaining three negative faces of the parallelepiped, they do exist on these faces too, with their magnitudes differing infinitesimally from their counterparts on the positive faces. It can be shown that the magnitude and direction of the stress vector on an arbitrary surface element at any point can be specified in terms of the nine Cartesian components of stress acting at that point. These components are written conveniently in a matrix form as the top left element is sigma xx, the top middle element is tau xy, and the top right element is tau xz. The middle left element is tau yx, the middle element is sigma yy, and the middle right element is tau yz. The bottom left element is tau zx, the bottom middle element is tau zy, and the bottom right element is sigma zz. The diagonal elements of the matrix are normal stresses, and the off-diagonal elements are shear stresses. 
the set of nine components of stress constitutes what is commonly called a second order tensor. That is why the term stress tensor is used to specify the state of stress at a point. Complementary shear, consider an elementary rectangular parallelepiped, delta x times delta y times delta z. The shear stresses on the four faces, AB, BC, CD, and DA, are shown in figure 1.12. Since the element is in equilibrium, the moment about any axis of all the forces acting on the element must be zero. Equating to zero the moment of forces about a line passing through A and parallel to the z-axis, we obtain tau xy times delta y times delta z times delta x is equal to tau yx times delta x times delta z times delta y. Therefore, tau xy is equal to tau yx. Similarly, tau xz is equal to tau zx and tau yz is equal to tau zy. It may be pointed out, out that the moment equation has been written under the assumption that there is no body couple in the material. Also, other stress components like sigma zz and tau xz are not shown in figure 1.12 because the forces corresponding to them do not contribute to the moment equation considered. It may also be emphasized that the moment has been taken of the forces, not of the stress components. In a similar way, it can be proved that tau xz is equal to tau zx as in equation 1.12b, tau yz is equal to tau zy as in equation 1.12c. We infer that shear stresses on planes at right angles are equal and are called complementary shear stresses. For example, tau xz is complementary to tau zx. Symmetry of stress tensor. We observe that the matrix representing the stress components is symmetric. That is, the matrix on the left-hand side. First row, sigma xx, tau xy, tau xz. Second row, tau yx, sigma yy, tau yz. Third row, tau zx, tau zy, sigma zz. The matrix on the right-hand side. First row, sigma xx, tau yx, tau zx. Second row, tau xy, sigma yy, tau zy. Third row, tau xz, tau yz, sigma z. In this representation, the symmetry of the matrix is evident through the equal off-diagonal components, where minus tau xy equals tau yx minus tau xz equal tau zx tau yz equal tau zy. This symmetry is a key characteristic of the stress tensor in physical systems. Principal stresses and principal planes. We considered an arbitrary surface element through a point in a stressed body and remarked that the stress vector on the element was, in general, inclined arbitrarily to the surface. However, it may happen that the stress vector on a particular surface element is normal to it, and therefore the shear stress component is zero. As a matter of fact, there are at least three such surface elements at any point on which there are no shear stresses. The normal stresses on these surfaces are called the principal stresses, and their planes are referred to as the principal planes. Another characteristic of the principal planes is that they are mutually perpendicular to each other, provided that there are only three distinct principal planes. If we choose the coordinate axes perpendicular to the three principal planes, it is easy to visualize that the stress matrix can be written as. The matrix represents the principal stress matrix, uh, where the diagonal components are the principal stresses sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and the off-diagonal components are zeros. This indicates that there are no shear stresses acting on the principal planes. Note that the shear stress components are zero as per the definition of the principal planes, see Fig 1.113. Specification of the principal stresses and their directions provides a convenient way of describing the state of stress at a point. We shall take up this aspect in detail later. Thank you for joining this lecture. Feel free to ask any questions.